Hi, Augustine, are you able to see me? Uh, yes, I can see you now. Great. Yep. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for joining us for our fourth webinar on bioethanol fuel standards. Um, my name is Sharon Okello. I'm a program manager at the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI. I oversee the Institute's Africa and Middle East um, programs. Um, today's webinar is going to focus on harmonized standards for clean cooking stoves and is funded by the Standards Alliance program. Um, this program is a public-private partnership between ANSI and um, It's also made possible thanks to ARSO, who's been partnering up with us on this webinar series. Um, uh, we're very grateful for the partnership, as well as uh, your members for um, continuing to join the meetings with us and uh, continue to have these uh, very productive conversations on uh, bioethanol fuels and clean cooking uh, as a topic. Uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank our U.S. expert speakers for their time and contributions towards today's proceedings. I'm really sure that um, the information that they have to share today will be very informative for um, everybody who's joining us here on our platform. Um, before we go into the program, I have a few housekeeping announcements to make. Um, so, um, just so you all know, um, participants have been muted, so you will not have the opportunity to speak freely. Um, please use the chat function or the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. We will take a few questions at the end uh, and any comments that you have to share, um, please indicate with, your, with a raised hand or use the chat function to um, provide your feedback in the chat. Uh, if you have any technical issues, please send them to me or Augustina um, via the direct message function. And then um, this session is going to be recorded and the presentations will be emailed to participants following the webinar. Uh, I hope everybody has a nice session and thanks for joining. Um, before we go straight into the program, I would like to call um, Philip Okung to give some remarks on behalf of ARSO. And then um, Alicia will um, sign on to speak. Thank you. Philip, are you there? Hello, Philip, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can. Um, yes, we can. Philip, we can could, you, hear you. could you join um, and give some remarks on behalf of ourselves? Sure, sure. Philip, we're ready for you when you're ready to um, give some remarks on behalf of ARSO. Hello, Sharon. Hello, Philip. Yes, hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Yes. You're welcome to speak on behalf of ourselves, say a few words uh, to the members for us to start the program. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, once more, I want to take this opportunity on behalf of the ARSO Secretary General to thank the ANSI, the USAID and the PIVOT for this continued uh, cooperation 
in the webinar series on the bioethanol standardization. This is our fourth uh, series that we are doing. And uh, I want to confess that they are all being very interesting. I want to take this opportunity to thank our panelists of today who have uh, dedicated their time. I know after the COVID-19, uh, their schedules have been very busy with lots of meetings going around. I want to thank Maria. I want to thank Christy. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Christian. Uh, it's our pleasure once more to join in this webinar series on bi bioethanol standardization. As we already know, we are in uh, a period where we are considering uh, these green energies. Uh, we know the cause of population and death that how it hurts Africa. Most of the African households still depend on the biomass and the, the traditional fuels uh, for cooking and for lighting purposes. And we know the damage this, that this one has caused in terms of pollution and in terms of the, the respiratory diseases. And in fact, uh, it is highlighted that it is one of the major causes of deaths in Africa. So the adoption of bioethanol technology, I think, is one of the strategies that also touches on the African Agenda 2063, as well as uh, the SDGs 2030 UN uh, Agenda uh, that is uh, inclined towards. Uh, sustainable development and uh, in fact about sustainability in the productions and consumptions around the world. And uh, I think the webinar also comes at a time that we are having the COP27 where the UN and the world at large uh, is uh, converging and having the meeting of the climate change at uh, in, in, in Egypt. And I think this one is one of the strategies that uh, we can also deploy in terms of standardization for this uh, uh, the climate the, the, the climate change uh, issues that are also affecting uh, everybody else, including Africa. So I want to take this opportunity once more to thank all the participants who have registered, who are already participating. And I want to use this opportunity to welcome you all uh, to this great session that we are having with our three panelists and with the support of ANSI that we have a good discussion and contributions. Thank you very much once more on behalf of the Secretary General. Kindly feel welcome for this webinar series. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thanks, Philip, for those remarks. I um, really, greatly appreciate it. Um, next, we will have um, Alicia El Mamouni speak on behalf of Pivot, who uh, Pivot is our implementing partner who's working on bioethanol fuels in the Africa region. And um, she will be um, moderating the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sharon and Philip. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for attending today um, for this fourth webinar on bioethanol for clean cooking. If you have not been able to attend some of the previous webinars, I'll give a quick background on Pivot so that you know who we are. Pivot is a global bioethanol coalition for household energy, and we open up access through smart policy and standards development, through advocacy and communication, and through business development for operators um, in the bioethanol space. And so today, um, we're very privileged to partner with ARSO, USAID, and ANSI um, to help present these webinars and provide some knowledge around bioethanol and also some guidance around how you can implement policies and standards um, to put in regulatory frameworks that are supportive for these sort of businesses. And so today uh, we will be looking at standards, the importance of standards and quality control specific to bioethanol, fuel and cookstoves. 
as well as the role that international organizations like ASTM and ISO can play in helping to establish these harmonized standards. Um, we'll look at the current standards in place for bioethanol cook stoves and fuel, and then also some national action that can be implemented to adopt or adapt some of these standards. Harmonization is um, really important to consider for the continent around fuel, around cook stoves, um, so that we can have standards that support policy and work in tandem to build regulatory frameworks that are supportive for these emerging bioethanol businesses. And so we're really excited today to have some um, expert speakers in these topics. And I think that you're going to um, learn a lot. I uh, would first like to welcome Maria Givaraj to present. Maria is the Manager of Global Cooperation and Training at ASTM International. And that's an international standards organization that develops and publishes voluntary consensus technical standards for a wide range of materials, products, systems, and more. And um, so she's going to get the webinar started this afternoon. Welcome, Maria. Thank you very much, uh, Alicia, for your kind introduction, and most importantly, for inviting me uh, to present on behalf of ASTM International. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am delighted to be here today among such distinguished uh, panelists. Before I start with my presentation, I would like to uh, give you a little bit of a background about myself. I am uh, a manager for global cooperation and training at ASTM International. I've been with uh, ASTM for almost three years now. And um, I, uh, I am originally from Mozambique and I, I'm always uh, happy to make a presentation uh, pertaining to Africa as I um, have quite a bit of experience working in the continent. I also would like to um, uh, set the scene for you by giving you a little bit of uh, a background to ASTM International. ASTM is one of the world's largest standards development organizations. Uh, we are a private nonprofit organization founded in 1898, so you can tell that we're pretty old. And we are based in Philadelphia, just uh, outside, um, in West Cushahock and rather just outside uh, Philadelphia or the state of Pennsylvania here in the United States. ASTM provides a forum for the development of voluntary consensus standards. We have over 30,000 members from over 155 countries participating in one or more of our 154 technical committees. Although our standards are developed uh, and used voluntary, they often become mandatory if referenced in regulation or used in a contract between a buyer and seller. ASTM standards are trusted and known for market relevance and technical quality, and they are the choice for many global industries. Apart from developing standards, ASTM also offers a variety of uh, uh, services, including training, which I'm intimately involved. Uh, some of you have um, um, been in contact with me through the procedural training sessions that I host twice every month on various topics pertaining to international standardization. We also offer proficiency testing certification as well as a, a, an electronic platform that facilitates collaboration with other standard developers, including the African Organization for Standardization, ARSO, whom I engage quite uh, uh, frequently in the continent. So let's start with uh, a brief explanation of standards. Not so long ago, standards were strictly technical documents. Today, they remain important benchmarks, but also have bottom line business implications. They are, they are the common language that promote the flow of goods between buyer and seller and protect the general welfare. 
Standards fuel global trade in international markets, creating a healthier and safer world for people everywhere and drive innovation in products and services. They are used by individual companies and government agencies around the world. Purchasers and sellers incorporate them into contracts. Scientists and engineers use them in their laboratories and offices. Architects and designers use them in their plans. Government agencies reference them in codes, procurement, regulations, and laws, and many others refer to them for guidance. So how are ASTM standards developed? This is a question that um, we get oftentimes when we make such presentations. A proposal for a new standard activity uh, can come from anywhere and everywhere inside or outside an existing technical committee. The ASTM committees in consultation with, with ASTM staff are responsible, responsible for determining if industry interest is sufficient, if another developer may already have a standard that satisfies the particular need, and if the industry is ready for a consensus standards program. Once the idea is approved by the committee, a task group begins the standards writing activity where the majority of the work is accomplished. Task groups are typically comprised of a small number of highly knowledgeable individuals that are brought together by their parent subcommittee to work on specific projects, namely development of new standards or revision of existing standards. The voting process on a standards action begins within the subcommittee and the standards action must pass successive sub subcommittee and main committee ballots and society review before receiving a final procedural review. Failure to achieve consensus in any level requires additional work by the, the, the sponsoring uh, agency or individual. Here on this slide, I would like to share with you briefly um, how standardization is important for a country quality infrastructure. So as defined by the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO, quality infrastructure is generally understood to be the totality of the institutional framework, both public and private, required to establish and implement standardization, metrology, accreditation, and conformity assessment services necessary to provide acceptable evidence that products and service, services meet defined requirements, be it demanded by authorities or the marketplace. So it is important to understand that quality infrastructure consisting of a number of institutions or service providers can only function properly as a whole and that the in incompetence or absence of any of one of the constituents will compromise the effectiveness and ultimately the efficiency of the whole system, thereby negatively impacting the business environment. So the foundational parts of quality infrastructure are the standards, and you see here uh, how the system works. So ASTM has listened to what industry and governments around the world want, and we have built those attributes. These are the attributes, the six attributes, which I'm not going to elaborate uh, uh, further uh, on them for the sake of time. Uh, so we believe that this is what the most innovative companies in the world are looking for to optimize their global value chains and to innovate their business models. So ASTM is an international, like I said, non-governmental standards organization, and um, we offer technical solution uh, uh, that strengthen the ability of industries and government to address market needs and challenges through trusted standards and related projects that positively impact 
the public and public, private sectors, improve lives and help our world work better. Again. So how do we accomplish these uh, tools that I've uh, made mention in the previous slide? So by using a process that complies with WTO TBT principles, that's how we accomplish this objective. So the WTO does not call out specific organizations that develop international standards. Instead, they have provided guidance in the form of six principles, which uh, a standards development organization must comply with to develop international standards. So the principles are there. There are six principles. I am not going to go over all the principles. However, I do like to uh, highlight the last principle on the slide, which is the consideration of developing nations, also known for capacity uh, uh, building. And this is pretty much what um, events like this offer. And us as ASTM, uh, uh, as ASTM, we do uh, focus on the on this principle because we believe that is the best way to um, um, share knowledge about international standardization. So, on this slide, I simply would like to um, share with you that ASTM supports global trade uh, through growth and development. And uh, um, it's also reasonable to say that we want to support the free flow of goods to markets by minimizing the cost of complying with regulations and making them uh, consistent or similar wherever possible. possible. Standards play a key role in accomplishing these objectives and using common standards help to reduce the cost of, uh, of compliance and facilitate compatibility. Standards development process, processes that support openness and transparency, transparency contribute to cooperation and limit uh, differences. So what is the role, uh, what role does ASTM play in international standardization in, to in today's global economy? Uh, as I highlighted in the previous two slides, um, we are very committed to um, our role uh, of uh, uh, international standardization and also in today's global economy. And we do that by, I mean, through our Memorandum of Understanding, which is our flagship program that was established in 2001 uh, with the goal to encourage information exchange and also uh, reduce the duplication of efforts. To date, we have 122 uh, MOU partners. Uh, I will share that slide in a minute with you. Uh, those 122 MOU partners include uh, 116 national standard bodies. Oops, just move a little faster. And six regional bodies in which uh, ARSO is one of them. Uh, through this MOU program, we uh, have had um, over 8,800 uh, um, ASTM standards being cited uh, by um, ASTM, um, uh, seven, by 75% of uh, our ASTM uh, technical committee uh, uh, members and countries. And also we have provided a wide range of uh, virtual um, uh, programs, including over a hundred uh, webinars, especially after COVID. So here, uh, here's the list of all our 122 uh, MOU partners. Uh, you'll see that um, on the, on this column, which is uh, the sixth column, you will have, Sud you have here Sudan, uh, which is the country that signed, last signed an MOU with uh, ASTM. And that MOU was signed uh, just uh, last uh, September during the ISO General Assembly in Abu Dhabi. 
Uh, I hope you see one of you see your countries represented here. I believe we have some MOU partners attending this webinar today. Now I would like to briefly discuss uh, the six ways to adopt and reference ASTM uh, standards. Uh, they are listed here. Uh, I will not focus on all of them because uh, I believe this presentation is not intended specifically for MOU partners. So uh, the options are shown here. Um, on the right hand side, uh, those standards, I mean, rather those ways are intended for public users. So anybody can incorporate uh, by reference, can uh, use normative reference and also code reference uh, um, uh, of ASTM standards. On the left hand side and in blue, uh, also methods available for exclusively available for our MOU uh, partners. So in the next uh, two slides, I'll focus on how regulators incorporate standards by reference, a practice widely used in United States. And also, um, um, and, and this uh, method is becoming increasingly, increasingly important to international regulators. Incorporation by reference simply means that a standard or specific session of a standard is called out by title in a regulation, law, decree, etc. When the regulation or law goes into force, the reference standards become a compulsory requirement of the new regulation. In the US, over 3000 ASTM standards are cited in our US Code of Federal Regulations. In fact, we have a law in the United States called the National Te Technology Transfer Advancement Act, which was signed into law into, in 1996. The law mandates that the, all US federal agencies use cooperatively developed standards, particularly those developed by standards development organization, organizations like ASTM, rather than developing their own standards. The law also promotes agency participation in standards bodies. Currently, uh, uh, over 1,000 representatives from federal agencies participating in about 90% of ASTM technical committees. Here, uh, I'll give you an example of uh, incorporating by reference. Uh, and the example is the by, by the Bureau, from the Bureau of Standards, Metallurgy and Inspection, uh, BSMI, uh, which is the administrative agency of the Ministry of Economic Affairs of the Republic of China, which is responsible for standardization, metrology, and product ins inspection in Taiwan. BSMI signed an MOU with ASTM in 2005, and this slide provides an example of how BSMI referenced several standards in their regulation for medical examination gloves. I wish I had uh, an example at this point uh, of what today's topic is all about. However, uh, this is also an excellent example of how a regulator has selected to use standards from multiple developers, including ASTM, ISO, and CEN, as well as allowing for equivalent standards. Doing so facilitates compliance with good regulatory practice and encourages regulatory convergence. Now let's talk, let's take a look at two ASTM international technical committees. And uh, on this slide, I'll be able to share a little bit more light uh, on uh, uh, the standards related to uh, bioethanol. So, First, I'd like to introduce ASTM Technical Committee DO2 on petroleum products, liquid fluids, and lubricants. DO2 is ASTM's largest technical committee with over 2,400 members from 65 countries. The members are consistent, uh, consistent of fuel manufacturers and distributors, as well as uh, fuel users and testing laboratories as and as discussed also regul regulators. This long-standing ASTM committee has developed 
over 800 standards, including standards for biodiesel fuel and fuel ethanol for blending with gasoline. In the chart, you can see that many African countries have referenced ASTM uh, ethanol standards for use in automobiles in their regulations by incorporating the standard. Um, um, and this standard is E3050, which I believe Christy uh, Moore will discuss in detail. So this standard has been cited by nearly three countries who are participating uh, in our MOU part, uh, program. And the countries include Tanzania, Nigeria, and Uganda. Next, we'll look at ASTM Committee E48 on uh, bioenergy and industrial chemicals for biomass. Although this committee is much younger in terms of its longevity, it is important I mean, its importance is growing and um, I mean, in the renewable energy sector. So committee E48 is the committee responsible for the standard E3050, uh, which I uh, discussed in the previous slide and is a key uh, uh, specification for the safe and efficient use of ethanol for uh, clean cooking, uh, uh, clean cooking. ASTM uh, has also been proud to have had this standard already featured in workshops in Uganda in, in 2016, in Zambia in 2018, and in Mozambique in 2019, which enable technical exchange on standards and uh, also facilitate, facilitates its adoption. Uh, I have covered a lot of material about ASTM, uh, the trade implication and aspects of regulation. So in conclusion, and as you are considering establishing appropriate legislation around bioethanol for the region, I'll leave you with a list of many benefits to uh, incorporating standards by reference. And this includes minimizing duplication and conflicting guidance, keep up to date with the most current technical information, reducing regulation development time and costs, and also contributing to a transparent process in which allows the use of other standards. Last but not least, it also maximizes uh, consensus and facilitates implementation of a, a proposed uh, rule. Um, I chose to end my presentation today with uh, some pictures depicting ASTM International Global Cooperation and Policy staff during a meeting with uh, Dr. Emojin, who had come to uh, Washington DC um, uh, just last March. And uh, I, uh, an important uh, point to note is that uh, uh, we do have a, a great relationship with ARSO. Uh, we are considered uh, we consider ASO as a strategic partner in the region, and through ASO we have been able to uh, expand um, uh, and, and, and extend our outreach in the continent. So we are grateful for that. Um, um, our relationship uh, has blossomed, especially in the last uh, three years. Uh, we have cooperated in uh, various areas, particularly in capacity building. So I, I hope these uh, pictures uh, tell a little bit of the story. Um, on this picture, uh, I just wanted to share with you uh, that uh, following that meeting with uh, Dr. Imogen, we uh, ASDM participated in uh, ARSO's General, General Assembly uh, that took place in Yaoundé, Cameroon. Um, we, we, we were uh, honored to have uh, um, you know, made a presentation alongside AOAC, ANSI, and ISO. And uh, here you see me uh, leading a focus group discussion on how ARSO ASTM, I mean, ARSO members can influence ASTM standards development. So I hope with today's presentation, you get uh, more involved. Uh, here's a list uh, of uh, our um, uh, representation throughout the world. And uh, also you can reach me um, through my email that is listed on this slide. With that, I wanna thank you very much for your kind attention. And I'll be happy to take questions uh, when Alicia uh, opens the floor for the question and answer. Thank you very much. Thanks, Maria. 
wonderful presentation, um, great background on ASTM. I want to bring on now Christy Moore. Christy is the founder of K Moore Consulting, and she's a consultant for Growth Energy. She is a leading authority on motor fuel quality, regulatory, safety, and environmental aspects, and specializes in renewable and alternative fuels. And so she is going to talk a little bit more about specific standards development and also um, specifically around bioethanol fuel and some of the standards that Pivot has been working on um, with Christy over the last year and a half. So welcome, Christy. I think I'm unmuted now. Is that correct? Yes, you're good. Great. Are you, do you have my slides, Alicia? I'm sorry about that. I do. Would you like me to present those? Yes, please. Okay. Maria did an excellent job. Um, while we're waiting for those slides to come on, let me try to answer a question that came through the chat um, from Mr. Jetter. The difference between equivalent and identical standards. Um, okay, so there, there are many test methods that can use different equipment and arrive at a result, but they may not have been um, proven equivalent. So you, so you have to prove that they're equivalent through you know, the various means of, um, there are some uh, standards that you can have different equipment arrive at a result and the, the two methods have been proven equivalent. Um, identical methods um, would be using, um, I don't know, I'm, Jim, I'm going to have to get back to you on that, because I think that there is an ASTM definition that provides the exact difference. So, Alicia, I'll take that note down, because there's a process at ASTM approving equivalency for technical methods. Good morning, my name is Christy Moore. I am a scientist. I've been working on renewable fuels and fossil fuel replacements for about 28 years in my career. Next slide, please. I started at the largest distillery in the world in Peoria, Illinois. I didn't transfer to a very large corn processing plant where we took in um, you know, 500,000 bushels of corn a day and made it into various sweeteners, starches, sugars, uh, proteins, um, some non karyogenic sugars for uh, gum and toothpaste. And we also made a lot of carbon dioxide and a lot of fuel. Um, I started my consulting gig in 2015, seeing a need for um, technical expertise, especially in a regulatory format in 2015. And in 2018, um, I started working around the globe and I work in about 20 countries um, on standards, standards adoptions, uh, renewable um, fuels, renewable chemicals, et cetera. Next slide. I work um, in four or five global standards organizations. Um, uh, ASTM is, is, uh, is, is a, uh, uh, excuse me, ASTM is a, is a great um, standards development organization that I've been working personally in for about 20 years. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, important elements to um, a robust standard. You, you've got to have the technical expertise, the subject matter experts, and it really is, as Maria said, um, a partnership between both the public and private sectors. You know, a standard must have sufficient detail for the reader in order to fully understand how to use the, the standard from a performance and from a safety and from an environmental aspect. Um, Maria did an excellent job talking about several of the largest committees at, at ASTM. But really what a standard must do is that it facilitates action or it facilitates commerce and business. And that's really what, what my job is as a consultant, is to ensure that we've got all the tools that we need to bring new fuels, bring new chemicals, bring new um, you know, energy aspects um, into commerce and to improve the, the performance, safety, and environmental aspects. Next slide. 
These are just a few of the standards organizations that I work in. Uh, ASTM International is, is one of the largest. I also work very closely with the government of Canada. Being um, from the United States, our number one trade partner is the is Canada, and we have, we exchange um, many many um, elements, products for energy, for food, for um, building materials, etc. And, and the way that these standards um, operate, these standards organizations operate, is that you know you you bring your expertise to the table and provide input and provide you know, um, a forum for discussion and education as we're building these standards. Uh, a, B, and T is, is a standards organization in Brazil. Uh, ISO is a, is a great organization that works globally. And then you've got the more spe uh, specific standards organizations like Underwriters Laboratory that deals with hazardous materials and ensuring that these products are intrinsically safe and, and not harmful to consumers. And then, of course, we work at SAE International, which is the Society of Automotive Engineers. Next slide, please. So really what these standards are supposed to do is facilitate business. Really, it facilitates commerce. From a government perspective, you know, we want to grow our gross national product. You know, we want to ensure that there's fairness in the marketplace. We want to ensure that if we're selling an item, that the buyer and the seller have a forum to exchange and agree upon all the attributes of a product um, from a government standpoint. They, you know, we want to ensure that there's no harm to consumers, there's no harm to the environment. And that, you know, because I do believe that we really are in a global economy, right? Nothing proves that we're a more global economy than the pandemic that we just all uh, survived over the last few years. And it really changed a lot of the ways that we did business and really highlighted the fact that we are in a global economy. And Maria mentioned several times that these consensus standards, when they're referenced by governments, by businesses, by legal, you know, commercial contracts, that really is the benefit of having a robust standard. Next slide, please. When we talk about ASTM, some of the many attributes that, that I like to highlight is that the stakeholder involvement, you've got thousands of members, you've got uh, you know two face-to-face -face meetings. I am um, a subcommittee a chairman in um, ASTM DO2. I chair CS, the Committee on Standards on 90, uh, number 93, which is international. And then I also um, used to be the chair of committee E48, where we are building standards to facilitate a bioeconomy from and all the products that come from bio refineries. Very important is there's balanced voting. There, in many times, you know, there there are um, benefits to maybe one sector of of you know, of commerce, maybe um, a, a producer or a manufacturer versus government versus a consumer or versus a, you know, a regulator, a government in, entity that, that would be an, an auditor um, or a general interest party. And at ASTM, we balance that voting so that no one sector can, can control a vote or that can um, level an agenda, you know, or have an agenda and, and, and control the narrative. And it really is um, a, a wonderful um, exchange of information. There are really, for, for a minimal fee, you can join as many committees as you, as you like, as many as you have time for, you know, whatever your, whatever your interest and specialty um, is. And I think at this point, I am active in about 10 ASTM committees. So it's, it's a lot. Next, next slide, please. What we're talking today and, and what I'm very passionate about is, is the use of ethanol as a cooking fuel. Um, I have read so many reports. It's, it's, it's not, um, it, it's having access to clean cooking energy is, is not common around the world. There are many countries that need access to um, just to survive and provide for our families. You know, when we talk about um, energy and switching energy sources, which is uh, but it's very prevalent in our elections here in the United States yesterday. You know, it's it's important that when we select a new energy platform, that you really take a look at all of the aspects of that energy. 
It really must be readily available to consumers. It, it's got to be, you know, appropriate for the use. It's, it's got to be fit for use. It's got to be cost effective. You know, it's got to be safe for human and the environment. As I sit here in California, the greatest debate is how to fuel our transportation needs and whether electricity or biofuels or fossil fuels or some combination of all of those is the way that we can address uh, climate change. And of course, they've had uh, massive wildfires here in California, and that is of top of mind for voters. So it, it's been very interesting to be here this week during um, during the, the voting and the election process. Next slide. So committee ASTM E48, Bioenergy, Industrial Chemicals from Biomass. This committee has been around for um, really over 25 years. For the first uh, couple of decades of its existence, or maybe this is the first decade, it really was focused on pharmaceuticals and bringing um, biotechnology to the marketplace in a safe and effective manner. And we've kind of morphed that committee into bioenergy and industrial chemicals from biomass. So really this is anything that's made from a plant, um, anything that's made from wood, anything that, that's got lignin, that's got sugars or starch in it, um, and whether that's, you know, uh, agriculture, regenerative agriculture, or, or whether it's natural woody biomass, uh, et cetera. We, we have got experts from around the world, 150 members and growing, that where we're coming together twice a year. We even have a virtual component. I really wanted to mention that, that we are trying to build um, access to the subject matter experts, even if it's virtually. We do understand that there's um, not only health concerns, maybe with uh, transport, travel, but there's also some cost, you know, that's associated with travel that we're trying to build. And ASTM is, is very willing and very supportive of us building all the avenues in order to facilitate the, the conversation to, you know, to, to share the experiences and to share these standards. But we have got a lot of standards under development in E48. Uh, a couple of them are specialized towards these types of applications. So, you know, the way this works is, you know, Pivot um, Clean Energies brings us this, uh, a problem and we go to build a solution. And that's really what happened with clean cooking. And we developed the standard and the number is E as in Edward, 3050 for ethanol and for cooking applications. And we had these conversations in 2014, 2015, and then the standard was finally published in 2016. Next slide, please. So this is what the, the document header, uh, the top of the document looks like. Um, there's a lot of information here. And, and as you get uh, accustomed to reading ASTM standards, this, this format really helps us as readers. It's, it, it, it's very standardized so that you know what the standard is, you know how to look up the number, you know what version you're on, and we have a standard, a standard way of titling, you know, creating and selecting the title so that the reader knows that they're selecting the, the proper standard. And this happens to be uh, the most current version. We just went through a rigorous voting process to update the standard, and, and now we've got a version 22. So it was it was just passed a few short weeks ago. Next slide, please. So at this at this point, the standard is uh, it started. I think Alicia, if I correct me if I'm wrong, but started as two pages. We're now up to four pages. So as this standard is used by by um, industry and by government, they bring questions back to the committee and back to the to the subject matter experts and and ask. Okay, well we've got an application. Can this standard apply in this country or? Can this standard apply for, for this use? And what if we have a, a regulation or, or something that we, we need to accommodate in this standard? We can propose you know, modifications. These, these documents are living documents and they can be modified um, at any point. And, and the, the robust ASTM voting process ensures that we are selecting the, the verbiage and the language, that we're not using slang or common terms to, to maybe one country need to be incorporated into the standard so that we're communicating with the reader. And so we're now up to four pages to ensure that we've, we've got, and, and of course this is a hazardous material because it needs to generate heat, right? 
And we want to make sure that we're communicating to the reader of the standard all of the elements that, that are needed for this, um, for this product in this application. So in the scope of the document, you know, we really spell out, okay, this specification is for denatured ethanol. It's an intended to use as a cooking fuel or an appliance fuel or both. And so it's important that all of those elements are, are first in the standard so that what to les éléments si vous cherchez quelque chose, this is exactly the standard I need. Or they can, you know, go to uh, search and find a standard for a different application. Next slide. Important elements about um, the standard, especially in commerce. So if you're buying and selling a product, you need to know how to identify you know, any of the parameters to evaluate the product, to ensure that the product hasn't been contaminated in transport or handling, or that it was, you know, manufactured appropriately for this application, you know, from the very start. So we have a whole section about reference documents. These are many times um, other analytical test methods. They can be government regulations. It can be, um, uh, expert papers. I know that um, the United States EPA has done a lot of work in this area. You know, if they've published a paper, if one of the other governments have published a paper, we will link it to this reference document section to ensure that we're giving all of the education and passing along all the details to the reader. And, and I would just take a minute to say that really in my work around the globe, ASTM test methods are really the most referenced analytical methods. They've, they've, got, they've gone through a very rigorous process and that um, they're very widely accepted, especially in my scientific community. Next slide, please. So when we talk about terms, we, talk, we need to explain, so, and, and many things can get lost in translation. Working in 20 countries, trust me, I, I'm, I, I need to clarify kind of like the equivalent versus identical standards. And I thought, Maybe I just need to go to the specific definitions. But, you know, when we talk about ethanol as an appliance fuel, ethanol is a very ubiquitous, naturally made, um, you know, biodegradable product that's water white and used, you know, in, in pharmaceuticals, in foods, in perfumes, in personal care uh, as a fuel and, and as a cooking um, energy. And so we need to provide that definition so that, so that no matter what language we're, we're speaking, that we can always go back to a translation and go to a common definition. Next slide, please. One of the most important elements of the, of the specification is the fuel specification table, where we're laying out specific um, limitations, exclusions, or expectations, as in concentration, that were um, communicating that both between the, the manufacturer, the buyer, the seller, the government, and consumers so that they know what they're buying. And these important parameters ensure that ethanol is going to operate appropriately, you know, that it has um, the, the, the correct amount of ethanol, like the concentration is high enough so that when it's ignited, that it's going to be safe and effective in that operation. And so we really control these units of measure. We control the maximum of these common properties and that you know how to test them. So there's a lot to learn from the fuel specification table. Next slide, please. And then because ethanol is a very highly regulated product because it can be used as a fuel, so it collects motor fuel taxes. It can be used as a cooking fuel, which you should not have to collect motor fuel taxes, but most importantly, so that it's denatured and denatured appropriately so that the government doesn't collect liquor taxes. So in the United States here, um, you know, ethanol may sell for $3, three U United States dollars per gallon, but there's also a $27 liquor tax by the government if it's for drinking or consumption. Well, clearly in this application where we're using it for cooking stoves, we need to put a material in the ethanol so that it's not subject to taxation. It, it makes it undrinkable and to avoid, you know, this liquor tax. So we need to be very clear and concise and spell out, you know what I mean, identify 
what exactly are allowable denaturants. And this was our, our focus um, on the last ballot. We felt that we needed to add some additional denaturants, add some additional references, so that if this product is used in Mozambique, which we most uh, certainly would like to see this happen, that it's very clear how we can denature the product, maybe even add a dye that's very commonly um, uh, used as a colorant. There's a colorant uh, made to make it a nice blue color so that um, it's not drinkable. You know, it sends a message to consumers this isn't a drinkable product. It really is an energy source. So we also talk about um, in this document about the parameters by which um, the, the, the specification table, why they're important. So many times we're handed a product and we're just supposed to use it. But when you're talking about a product that's for a compliance or um, uh, for an appliance fuel, it's very important to consumers. It's important to know why are we controlling each of these specific properties? And, and this is such a great education for the reader. It's an education for the government, it's an education for industry, and even for consumers. And so as product is, is shipped around the globe in uh, barges and ships and rail cars and trucks and ISO containers, and whoever is, is ensuring the quality and, and checking the seals and some of the security so that the product arrives at, the, at its destination importantly, you know, or uh, in, as, as it's intended and, and meets the specification, you can go to this section of the document and really learn a lot about what the product should look like and why are we testing it for these various parameters. And we even have included some industry recommendations so that we're, we're passing along the very best information that we can. Next slide. Workmanship and sampling. These, um, once the product is, is starting to be on the move for storage and handling, these become two of the most important sections of the standard. Workmanship in, ensures that we are delivering a product as it's intended for the use in the best condition, you know, making sure all the conditions for storage, handling, and use have been, ha have been followed, and that there's no um, contamination, no unintended consequences by maybe um, transporting the product w w in a in a vessel that you know maybe wasn't appropriate or wasn't cleaned appropriately from the from the prior contents that it hauled, et cetera. And so the workmanship really is education for everyone who's seeing this product throughout the, the logistics to ensure that it's going to be fit for use at the end. And sampling containing containers and sample handling really provides the testers of the product with the appropriate instructions on how to, you know, ensure that we're identifying the product, we're sampling the product, and, and then we're confirming all the parameters of the product. And, and so you don't go out and get, you know, two or three liters of a product when really all we needed was one liter to ensure the contents, you know, of the package. And lastly, the, the, there's some final sections of the standard where we've worked very, very diligently to ensure that, you know, we're, we're passing along an appropriate test method so that the product can be tested. Uh, we want to make it easy for you to find this standard. If you're looking for a cooking fuel, we're going to identify keywords because, you know, ASDM has thousands, 30,000 some standards, and, and it's very in order to, to not have to search all day for a standard that you're looking for, we try to put the keywords and the details out to make sure that these standards are easy, easily found. And, and the new ASTM website is, uh, is fantastic. And it really allows you to, to see the full scope of all the options of standards, um, even um, specific to different industries. But then we've also got a way to, to narrow it down and really find these standards. And then of course, we've got an appendix to ensure that we're passing along, you know, any other information. You know, I just wanted to take a quick minute to, to, to talk about some of the things that we're doing at Pivot. And that is um, helping governments and help, helping industry to find, you know, trends in renewable products in low carbon fuels that are um, 
you know, natural or biodegradable, better for the environment, not toxic to consumers, et cetera. And so what we can do um, as a as, a, as an organization is identify various standards and identify overlap. So one of the benefits of ethanol, not only is ethanol use uh, growing globally, but one of the things that, that Alita and I have been able to do is identify that you could actually buy a single product that would meet two ASTM standards that would provide um, you, you know a lot of benefits for fungibility and the logistics and trying to bring improved economics. We understand that economics around the world is, and access to, to clean energy is, is, is not standardized. It's, it's, it, in many countries, this, this type of energy is, is too expensive. And, and thus, you're, you're, you're resulting back to cheap, dirty energy for these type of applications. Well, one of the things that, that we're trying to identify is how can you bring a product in for multiple purposes. You know, what if ethanol could be used for a clean cooking fuel, also be used for blending in gasoline, et cetera, and, and then bring not only great supply options, but also bring, you know, lower prices for, for energy use. And, and this, is what, this is what we're trying to do in these type of technical memos is help industry to select the energy sources that have multiple uses that can bring improved economics to bring these clean energies. And then, you know, just some final thoughts. Um, ASTM standards, um, uh, I am promoting around the world. Um, one, because I'm part of the process. I believe in the process. Um, I'm a subject matter expert um, in several committees, but I also recognize that there's other people in the room or there's other folks that are contributing to these standards that bring a wealth of expertise. And I think that these standards um, expand um, the knowledge and, and, and facilitate clean, clean energy and clean commerce. You know, these adoption of these standards can be as easy as Maria said, as a, a inclusion when you're writing the regulation. Um, I'm currently in the middle of um, five states of the United States where we're writing regulation. And it is always my recommendation to reference ASTM standards so that you have um, a platform by which you can start a discussion on clean energy. Um, importantly, these are living documents. If you read the standard and there are elements even specific to Africa or to Mozambique or you know any other parts of the world, that we can include that information in these standards. You can make a proposal to the committee. Um, you know, not only are the committee chairs ac you know, accessible to you really about 365 days out of the year, but you can meet with them face-to-face -face in their two meetings a year or you can participate virtually. There's really a lot of avenues for communication within the ASTM process to ensure that these documents are living documents and that we're making the changes to keep them, you know, uh, up to date and, and current with the most, you know, accurate information. And then we have asked ASTM to allow uh, participants in our webinar today to, to, to look at this standard at no cost. We never want um, a cost to be a prohibition to, to, to the use of an ASTM standard. And so we've, we've asked ASTM and they graciously um, allowed us. So this link and this presentation will be available to you. And here is the password. And so um, we, we invite you to take a look at this standard uh, and provide information. Um, the, the graphic that I have here shows that ethanol really does um, transport through the, the petroleum, the fossil fuel world, which brings a um, huge amount of access to logistics, to terminals, to storage, you know, et cetera. And, and really we have put ethanol through identical channels as, as we remove, uh, as we move petroleum products around the, around the world, which is one of the largest global economies. And so um, bringing ethanol is, is getting easier. It, it's getting more economical. And, um, you know, as long as there's um, some willingness to look at some standards to ensure that the product delivers appropriately, um, I think there's a, a lot of great benefits that ethanol can do. And I would thank you with that.
Thanks, Christy. Thanks, wonderful presentation. And again, I would encourage all of you to take a look at that standard and the link. Um, we're really grateful to ASDM for allowing us to share that. And it's been a long process getting it amended and ratified. And we're really proud of um, getting it to the place where it is today. And, and hopefully that will continue to open up access in multiple sectors. So please uh, look at that at your leisure. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Christian Larange. He's an assistant professor of research at Colorado State University, and his research focuses um, include household energy in the developing world, the development of low-cost air quality sensors, and human health climate implications of energy usage. So welcome, Christian. Great. Thank you for having me today. I'm uh, cognizant of our time, so I'll try and be... Um, efficient with my presentation here, but I'm happy to answer additional questions offline afterwards if we run out of time. What I'm going to be talking about today is some work that's been occurring over the last 10 years or so associated with developing of standards through the international standards organization process specifically related to clean cooking. We chose this route of going through the ISO um, standard, like I said, about a decade ago, to try and find a, a platform that was accessible globally. Operations like the ASTM is also a great um, mechanism, but with the, the amount of international collaboration and interconnections that were necessary, we decided to start on the international platform. The process started really in earnest around 2012, although there were multiple decades of work leading up to getting us prepared to develop these standards. The, the main goal we had was to try and get us to a point of some common language, some common uh, methodologies, some common practices, so we could move the quality of household energy systems in a positive direction, get better products, and uh, as a part of that or as a result of that, lead to cleaner indoor air in homes and in the environment in general. The process in the ISO framework really kicked off with what we term the Lima Consensus. This is a, a document, a consensus, a voluntary document that was put out outside of the ISO process, but it was a group of technical experts coming together saying, here are some things that we agree on in general. Here are the kind of the aspects of household energy that we think we need to be looking at. Here are the gaps. Here are we can move forward and set up a, a starting point for us to have very tangible discussions about all the things that we agreed about early on. And then in 2012, uh, we put together an ISO international workshop agreement. This is not a standard but a document that has gone through the ISO process, again, saying, here's what we agree on, and was the launching point for Technical Committee 285, which is an ISO standards committee specifically geared towards household energy, uh, primarily in the developing world. You can see the, the various meetings that have been done over the last 10 years or, or so. One thing that I'm very proud of about in terms of this organization is the amount of international buy-in and support that we have. We currently have 23 participating countries and 24 observing countries. The distinction between that is a, an ISO small nuance thing. Essentially, it's what level of commitment these different countries have had. But that the real takeaway is around 50 countries that have been actively participating in developing and getting these standards published over the last 10 years. There's a lot of work going on, but we can broadly break that up into four subject areas. Uh, the first is a conceptual framework. How do we tie all these very kind of disparate and diverse cook stove and household energy components that exist? How can we get them to crosstalk and have a, a common language that all these standards can be talking about together? We then have a lot of laboratory testing. This is very uh, precise, detailed testing occurring in the laboratory, really geared on evaluating products. How do the physical cook stoves perform? What are the emissions of those cook stoves and the implications of those emissions? 
One component of that has been establishing a series of voluntary performance targets. And we'll talk about that as we move forward a little bit. This is essentially a, a single set of numbers that we can use to quickly and easily convey the performance of a cook stove. Oftentimes, uh, when we get into the real technical details of evaluating a product, it quickly goes over the heads of a general consumer. So the voluntary performance targets try and be a more concise, easily understood method of us conveying results. We then have field testing, how do these perform, how do these products perform when they go out into the real world? And how do these products interact with real people, which is that social impacts component. Now, this is a pretty um, overwhelming set of pieces to see all in one snapshot. So we'll try and talk about how they interact here in just a little bit. One thing I do want to highlight, though, is this, um, the fact that we're coming up on a renewal process for several of these key standards. I'll talk about this when we get to the end, but I really encourage this audience, if this is a topic that you are interested in, now is the time that you can get involved in the process and help us improve and refine these standards and methodologies moving forward. So we get this all the time. We have all of these standards with uh, not always very clear names and extremely complex numbers that make no sense at all. How is any general person supposed to keep this straight? And the answer I always give is don't look at these as individual standards, but instead about how all these standards interact together. And I really like to frame the question from these standards try and cover a progression from very technology focused um, methodologies and measurements to more people-focused measurements. So if on one far side of the spectrum, we're talking about the technology and on the other side, the people, and somewhere in the middle we have these interact, roughly our standards fall into one of two categories. They're either tests and methods that we're conducting in the laboratory. These are very highly controlled tests or uh, protocols and methods that leave the controlled environment of the lab and occur more in the real world. So of all those standards I tossed up there quickly before, this is roughly how they, they fall into place. We have the Harmonized Laboratory Protocol. This is the first of the standards that came out from TC285. And it was a standard approach and methodology for us to capture and evaluate the emissions, performance, safety, and durability of household cookstove, stove, uh, household cookstove products. Uh, the standards that I have listed currently in green are things that have already been published and have made it out into the public sector, uh, where the ones in gray are currently under development still. Uh, so those lab tests are fantastic. They're highly controlled, uh, very repeatable, but in some ways may not fully represent what's happening in the real world. That's where this field testing methodology for quick stoves come in. Let's accept the fact that the field will be more variable, but let's see the wider range of performance that's going to occur when we put these products out into real people's hands. When we're talking about these field testing methodologies, we have to accept that we're gonna have highly variable results. That's just the nature of field testing in many cases. And so it's no longer that the results I get in one site, in one location, are necessarily going to agree with the same results you get in a different location, but we know how this stove performs in this environment. And that's an important piece of information when you're looking at real world impacts. In addition to these kind of high level uh, protocols, we also have a number of standards and technical reports coming out that try and connect all of these. And again, not to view these as disparate individual standards that we're looking at by themselves, but instead of as a broader ecosystem about how we do large scale, um, holistic evaluations of cookstoves. So some of this is the, um, establishing common terminology that we can agree on between all of those protocols, as well as some guidance about how you select the most appropriate protocol for your given needs. Uh, one piece that we get a lot of questions about is this concepts concept of voluntary performance targets. These targets are a classification system or a, a tier system, if you will, that we can take the wide range of emissions and performance results we free, see from different technologies and try and put them into bins. Um, 
so that instead of having to convey to a general customer in the marketplace or to a policymaker or you know, a, a developer, the very specific detailed test results, we instead try and put them into bins with this concept of as your tier value gets better, you may not fully understand all the test results, but you know that the performance of that stove is getting better and better and better. It's a more digestible, easy to understand approach, in our opinion, to convey these results. One thing I really like to highlight here is there is no tier five cook stove. We have five different categories that we evaluate cook stove performance on, thermal efficiency, carbon monoxide emissions, particulate emissions, safety, and durability. Each one of these parameters are scored individually because it's really important that we don't overly simplify the system, but instead convey how each one of these different parameters may be getting better or worse or how they compare between different cook stoves. Because on your particular program and for your particular needs, you might have higher priorities in one of these categories versus another. A great example of this is potentially emissions. In communities that have very closed in homes with very little air exchange, carbon monoxide emissions might be a really, really important parameter for you from a human health standpoint. On the other hand, if that cook stove is being used in the community where cooking outdoors is more of a common activity, maybe it's less critical that we improve carbon monoxide and it's more important that we can improve the safety um, to the user. So by looking at these tiers individually, we get a much more holistic view of how the stove is performing and provides us a lot more ability to make smart decisions when choosing technologies, as well as smart decisions when we're trying to improve these technologies. For thermal efficiency, safety, and durability, these tiers were established ranging from what we really considered pretty rudimentary technologies that you saw in very um, typically rural and rustic environments to aspirational goals, stoves and performance that might be very, very difficult to achieve in some cases, but where we felt like it needed to be to provide the utmost safety wherever possible and to be as efficient as possible. Carbon monoxide and particulate matter are a little different. These tiers were established based on health metrics. So these different tier ratings were tied to some modeling that was done to try and uh, have a better understanding of what these different emissions rates mean in terms of human health and risk to human health. So because of our short time, I'm going to have to go through this quickly, so I apologize about that. But what was done was this a process of what's known as a single zone box model analysis. So we linked the laboratory-based emissions to estimates of what somebody might be exposed to in a household if they were using the stove. These models are based upon assumptions about how much air is coming into a home and how much it's leaving, the size of the kitchen, and the amount of time cooking is occurring, as well as how clean that cook stove is. We do some um, fairly basic math, some things that we can't get to now to estimate what the concentration in that home is going to be based on all these parameters. Now, these, of course, vary all around the world. There is no single set of numbers that you'd be able to use that represents all households equally. So instead, what we had to do is we did a large meta-analysis of what are the common sizes and the common ranges for these different parameters in homes around the world. And we selected some default values. What's important to, rep uh, to recognize is these values do not represent any specific home. Instead, they represent a reasonable starting point when we're having to make these assumptions. Your communities might be slightly different, but it allows us to at least get a first pass estimate, kind of a first order estimate of what the health implications of different emissions rates are likely going to be when using these stoves. For particulate matter, these relationships are based on what's known as a dose response or an exposure response curve. And we tied these tiers to acute lower respiratory infections. So what you see in the blue line there is a dose response um, and what the uh, increased risk an individual would have 
if they were exposed to different levels of particulate matter and what their health risk would be. So as an individual is exposed to more and more particulate matter, so smoke, they have an increasing risk of um, developing acute lower respiratory infections. But this is not a linear relationship. We see we have a sort of tailing off curve there. And so what we did is we tied different levels of exposure to different levels of relative risk and set the tiers associated with that. So as an example, moving from tier one to tier two, we have a fairly large range of exposure reduction there in terms of, and uh, a relatively small adjusted risk, all things considered. The other thing that I really like to point out when we're looking at curves like this is how clean do we really need to get to have the greatest health effects? We have to get very, very clean, which is where I think technologies such as yours and the fuels that you're promoting, promoting could play a huge role, is we really have to get to these cleanest, cleanest levels to have large health impacts. And so what we're able to do is we're take, able to take curves such as this and tie them to tiers. Again, because I know we only have five minutes here, I'm gonna go quite quickly, but I believe these slides are going to be shared after the, the webinar today. And I'm happy to answer more questions about these offline, if that would be useful. For carbon monoxide, we don't have the same sort of health response curve that we're able to do there. So instead of the tier, instead the tiers are tied to World Health Organization exposure guidelines. Again, a decreasing exposure, indicating a lower health risk, and therefore a higher tier rating. So a question we get all of the time is if the voluntary performance targets are really based on what people are exposed to or kind of modeled based on what people are exposed to, well, why don't we just use field data from the very get-go to develop these tiers? And the simple answer is the field is just simply too variable. Although we can develop very standardized methods to conduct tests in the field, it's hard to achieve highly repeatable results in field testing. And so because we wanted to capture a single number as a starting point to represent these different kind of ranges of cook stove technologies, the tiers were tied to laboratory tests. Laboratory testing can tell some very important information about cook stoves, but they're not perfect. It can tell us a lot about the ideal performance and the best case performance of how this stove can be done. And it's very effective for screening of cook stoves, really differentiating cook stoves and fuels that have a high probability of being successful and those that really have very little chance of having large health or climate benefits. What lab testing doesn't do is it doesn't tell us at all what the customers are actually going to like or want or be willing to use. And that's a very, very important consideration when we're looking at are these technologies and fuels going to be successful in practice when we put them out into the field. So I'm going to go back to this. Um, analysis doesn't end in the laboratory. And this is why I really, really push the importance that these standards and protocols should not be viewed in isolation, but should be viewed as a collection of lots of methods that we should be doing together and in um, kind of sequ uh, in sequence to fully characterize and fully understand if a stove or fuel is really going to be impactful in the real world. We can use lab testing to identify stoves that could be beneficial, but the analysis cannot stop there. This is a fairly new set of protocols. And so one of the initiatives that's going on right now, supported by the Clean Cooking Alliance and the US EPA, is a series of what we're terming round robin testing where labs from around the world are all testing the same stoves using the same methodologies, these new ISO protocols, and um, quantifying the level of variability and the level of agreement and where the problems might come up so we can improve the quality of all of these protocols moving forward. So one of the other questions I get all the time is, well, this standard is not perfect for my needs. Let me tell you why we need to improve. And I'm, I'm fully supportive of that. I would love to hear your opinions about where the ISO protocols can be improved. But the other thing I would really, really encourage you is to get involved. To have a voice on improving these protocols, you need to be at the table participating. It's technical, technical experts from around the world working together 
that make these protocols better and get us to where we really need to be. So again, I want to highlight two of these protocols and two of these uh, standards that are coming up for renewal. The lab test will be starting the renew renewal process in 2023, and the field test will be renewing or starting its renewal process in 2024. Now is the time to get involved if you have suggestions about how we can improve these protocols and make them more appropriate for your needs. A few final takeaways. These standards should not be used in isolation, in my opinion, but instead as a total collection to get a good idea of what's really happening. Tiers are not to be reported in, or as an aggregated single value, but for each of the uh, parameters individually. And standards are just one tool. We care about impact in the real world, not just the standards. The standards are helpful, but we also need to make sure that monitoring, enforcement, and a strong policies back all of these. I'm sorry for going quickly there, but I'm happy to answer questions offline, or if we have a few minutes now, I'm happy to do that as well. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. Um, we are up against the hour, but I do want to provide just a, a few minutes if you can stay online for a couple of questions. And then as all of our speakers have mentioned, uh, we will provide the slides, the contact information, um, all, the informa all the information from this webinar afterward. And so please feel free to reach out to myself, to ANSI, to any of these speakers, and ask them questions directly that you might have, or if you want to get more involved, um, how to go about that process. Happy to help. Um, we will open it up, though. If anybody has questions, please jump in and... Um, we'll try to get those answered for you. Esther, go ahead. Let me see if I can unmute you. Maybe you can't do that yourself. Okay, go ahead. Is it innocent? Um, you're free to, to ask your question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I was asking the last presenter, uh, I saw in one of the slides that the temperature for cooking, for bioethanol cooking was um, more than uh, 200 degrees centigrade. And then I was wondering, because um, in cooking also, uh, there's some recommendation that uh, the, height, the temperature uh, may cause degradation actually to some compound which are uh, uh, considered as the uh, heterocyclic aromatics. Uh, how is the balance between uh, the use of bioethanol uh, and the safety as far as, you know, uh, this cancer cause, causing uh, agents are concerned? Thank you. Sure. Christian or Christy, do you want to address that, the um, emissions that result from using bioethanol? Sure. I can go quickly and kind of highlight on a couple of pieces there. Um, for any emissions uh, process, it's a combination of the fuel, the temperature, and the air fuel mixing. So it's hard, and I think it's slightly dangerous in some cases to overgeneralize that. What I will say is ethanol in a good stove when operated properly can be very clean, but no technology is completely clean. So I think that's where it's important for us to uh, strive for the best and also understand where the risks can come about. In terms of those polyaromatic hydrocarbons that you're talking about, that is one issue that has been brought up with fuels like bioethanol in, in some cases. Um, again, if done well, 
it can be a pretty small problem. I think where the problem is and where I think the importance of standards, such as the ones that have been talked about today, is keeping the, the poor technologies out so that the good technologies uh, can be successful. Because it only takes a few technologies being implemented poorly with the branding of good things for the entire sector to struggle. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, we see that with um, poor quality fuel, you don't get good combustion, you do produce some harmful emissions. And so it is really important to have these standards in place to have education around them. So people are implementing a safe fuel and technology. Christy, did you have something to add? No, I, I thought Christian did a great job. And, you know, in these energy sectors, we're making choices. Right, and and we're we're making choices, and and they've got to be available and a you know abundant and economical, and then of course clean, right? And what clean, right? And we're making choices, is, and I think we're making them in comparison, and that's the most important thing. You can't identify an energy source by itself. It's really all about choices and comparisons to what are my other options. Yeah. A question That's from Alaya Yanusa. Go ahead. Yunusa, Elia, are you able to unmute yourself? Or you can also type a question into the chat box if that's easier. Okay, I see the hand went down. So maybe the question was answered. Um, yes, go ahead. I see your hand. Agustina, are you able to unmute Yanusa Alaya? Okay, let me see. Um, I've asked them to unmute. I'm able to do that, but hopefully they see. Are you able to click on the little microphone on your screen and unmute yourself so that you can speak? Um, I don't think they might be able to. Okay, now I think that, yeah, good. Okay, perfect. Can you Go hear ahead. me now? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, my question is to Kristen Moore. Well, not really a question, but a clarification. Uh, the natural specification, unfortunately so far, there has been no harmonized uh, specific level uh, from studies and uh, different uh, narratives, we have different figures from one to five to up to 30 volumes of the natural using a methanol. Why I'm asking this, if to America, Canada, the level of uh, the natural is for tax. In some developing countries, there's a big concern by the time the technology comes to, to be, because it can be used for portable, and that is where the question comes in. Is there a way of increasing the level of methanol, but still the fuel will still remain ignitable? So this is the clarification I want from Christine Moore, please. Thank you. Thank you. 
Christy, you're muted. Oh. There, I don't know what happened. It, it said okay. I couldn't unmute myself. Thank you, and that is a very good question. We have, we have talked at length, um, many days, many meetings about the methanol content. Um, we feel um, at this point that um, in other countries that we needed to um, um, put a limit on the methanol content to use it as a denaturant, not as a co-processing or not as a, um, a another fuel because um, we thought the integrity of the product was more important to keep methanol as a denaturant rather than promote methanol as a fuel. And, and we've had this discussion um, many times. We, you know, if there is an interest in developing a standard that allows methanol at a higher concentration, we feel that that is, should be a standalone and an individual um, specification. And, and we would, you know, we could bring that for the committee. You know, methanol has caused us um, great harm over the years. You know, methanol, while it's a, a single, you know, carbon molecule, uh, car a carbon alcohol, it has a, a lot of vapor pressure problems for automotive use. It, it's got some properties that um, make it suspect um, in the fuel system, suspect as in it could be a potential corrosion point, et cetera. I understand that there's some ways to, to mitigate corrosion. There's also some issues with toxicity. Um, and so it, it, we can use the hand sanitizer um, situation that we had over the last two years in the pandemic. Unfortunately, there were many instances where um, humans, people were poisoned because they had contaminated ethanol with methanol for the hand sanitizer application. And methanol you cannot put on your skin. It is very harmful and it's toxic. And we and there were some some deaths. People had died because of the contamination with methanol. We wanted to be very specific and make sure that this, that this standard is for ethanol for applications for cook stoves. We also wanted to be very specific to show that ethanol can be used for a transportation fuel. Now, we could, you could take the standard E3050 and grab the standard for methanol and put those together to make the blend that would be appropriate for cooking fuels for your geography. But we think at this point, um, it's better to keep the standards uh, specific to ethanol as, as a high concentration. I I, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. And um, by including methanol as an option within the standard, that doesn't mean you have to add it. It's um, it's allowed up to 5%. We would prefer to see no methanol present in the fuel. Um, there are other denaturants that are recommended. Uh, there's bitrix, for example, which causes a really bitter flavor to the, the bioethanol, so it prevents drinking. There's the dye to help make it visually um, apparent that it's not a beverage alcohol um, and then obviously some other allowable hydrocarbons uh, if they're present in the, the fuel as well that can act as denaturants. So it's not a necessity to have that within the fuel, but it is allowed up to 5%, understanding that in certain geographies, that might be what they have available or it might be necessary. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I am going to stop questions, but please, if you do have questions that didn't get answered today, or you think of something later, reach out to myself or one of the speakers, and we will ensure that you get your questions answered. Um, we're very interested in continuing to promote bioethanol on the continent and um, ensuring that it is rolled out in a safe and effective way, and that we can utilize these standards um, to pair them with policy and create enabling environments um, that will help foster a bioethanol economy that will um, provide opportunities for agriculture, for manufacturing, for production, and a safe 
uh, option for homes, that they have a clean energy source that's affordable and accessible. So um, again, thank you very much to our expert speakers, to Dr. Larange, to Christy, to uh, Maria, as well as to Arso for helping to facilitate this platform and ANSI and USAID for all of their support and the technology as well. So big thanks to everyone. Um, we hope to see you at the next webinar on bioethanol business implementation. Thank you. Um,